Good evening, everyone. Please give rise to the motivation of bodhicitta, the awakened mind, which is in this case the thought that you will listen to the Dharma in order to bring all beings without exception to the state of perfect awakening. ตินิมิเสกตังอปุลโลตะตะลมะเลนนิยอริงโบจินโดสุงตะมะนะโตกามะนิเทวะยอเปกะตินิตังมะนะโตโมเชชิดะกะนุโยเดตินิตะดิม
And these two things, to help beings on the spot and to bring beings to uh, freedom, are the entire uh, purposes uh, of Dhamma, of the Buddhist teachings. Interestingly, tonight is the full moon, and also, although we can't see it from here, a lunar eclipse. In general, uh, for some reason, Buddhists believe that the eighth day of the lunar cycle, the 15th day or full moon, and the 30th day or new moon, uh, are especially powerful days for spiritual practice. And all the more so uh, when, as it does tonight, the 15th day uh, coincides with a lunar eclipse. So it's probably good luck that we're starting uh, our weekend in discussion uh, this evening. Well, Sosuki We are all ordinary people on the path, which means, especially now, when we happen to be living, that we are extremely busy. We are busy with our jobs, busy with our families, busy uh, with our businesses. In the context of our real lives, as we live them nowadays, the idea of our devoting our lives to seclusion, to practicing in an isolated retreat or hermitage, is something of a joke. It's just not going to happen. Yet, wherever we are, we are always accompanied by our mind. If we study our mind, 
if we become familiar with our mind, then everything we do can become spiritual practice, and both indirectly and directly beneficial to others. And this is why the cultivation of bodhicitta, the awakened mind, by which in this case I mean the intention to achieve perfect Buddhahood in order to bring all others to that state, is so important. It's so important that it is said about it in the first moment when someone gives rise to that motivation, they are transformed forever from the benighted or afflicted being they were in the previous moment to a future bodhisattva. And this transformation is as dramatic and as irrevocable as the legendary transformation of lead into precious gold. The essence of this bodhicitta is simply wanting everyone, every being, to be completely and perfectly happy. Wanting everyone, every being, to be completely and perfectly free from all types of suffering. In order to give rise to this motivation, and in order that it grow within us, it's very, very helpful, one could say important, to keep in mind how beneficial and how powerful this apparently simple way of thinking really is. ま、てたわけ、にょもとがてかなてにおいよ、せんのがねがらつけ。せんてにおいよ。せんてにおもがわんでじょんどわ。せんてしゃだんがわんでじょんどわ。たってね、だまんでにょもとががわんでじょん
tale cosa io ho detto che 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 io ho detto Then it was the gas, for a chill, and it's my pound, the shell, shell of the one that was in my toy, taking a few parts of the tarn and dog money. Taking a rank, some band of water, one that I make a tap, which I took a simmer. That's the summary of what you found from the candle, till I can in your account. Then it take what a mountain that was a chain, then it remained a yendola, that charging for. According to the Buddha, we um, are running in circles, which he called circling or spinning, uh, samsara. And essentially, um, the character of this is that we are uh, mostly very reactive. We react to what happens, and we don't seem to have any control over how we react. And because our reactions are harmful to us, uh, we call them poisons. These poisons are uh, such states as apathy, aversion, attachment, pride, and jealousy. What's interesting about these states of mind or reactions is that, of course, they are just in our mind. They come from our mind. They are wholly of the mind. Yet, nevertheless, they can overpower our mind. And once we become overpowered by these reactions, our motivation, our reason for acting in the world, becomes corrupted, becomes impure. And that is the source of what everyone nowadays calls bad karma. The reason why bodhicitta is so important and so accessible is that if, through cultivating the motivation of bodhicitta and um, sticking to it with mindfulness and alertness, your motivation in every action will automatically be pure and authentic. Which means that no matter where you are and how you live, you will be constantly accumulating an inexhaustible store of goodness. So therefore, bodhicitta, the awakened mind or the mind of awakening, is really the root and a starting point of all Dharma, of all the Buddhist teachings. Without it, we can talk about other aspects of Dharma, and they can be very entertaining, but they won't do us much good. Now, I mention this because I know perfectly well that the stated title of tonight's public talk was The Union of Mahamudra and Zotan. <laughs> These are authentic terms for uh, coming from our Buddhist tradition. And uh, the problem with uh, talking about these uh, off the bat is that if you want to build a skyscraper, you need to first create a foundation that is both stable and deep enough to support the weight 
of that many stories. If you don't, if you just start by building the skyscraper on top of whatever ground you, you have to work with, it's really uncertain how long that building is going to last. Buddhist jargon, especially our Tibetan Buddhist Vajrayana jargon, like Mahamudra and Dzogchen, sounds very, very good, very attractive. But it is extremely unlikely that it will do anyone much good unless they've undergone quite a bit of a study and preparation. Now, I mention this because although, as I said several minutes ago, there are many of you who uh, are somewhat senior students, I think there are many more of you who are quite new uh, to all this. And for a, a new practitioner to listen to uh, me babble on about Mahamudra and Dzogchen would really be like you're sitting in this room listening to the pleasant sound of a light rainfall out of doors. It's a very pleasant sound. We all agree on that. It's soothing. It's calming. But the rain is out there. It's not touching you. And in the same way, this, all of this um, highfalutin jargon wouldn't really do uh, your minds uh, any good. So I think that we need to begin our discussion by um, exploring the awakened mind itself. Benna, Tapurla, Yawa Dog Sunny, Yom Nendig, Chut, Bimas, but Tata Jimbo. Hello, Chut, some good gardening la, name, the name, ten or so name, the name that I'm gonna pay my favorite Tata Jimbo, the name, the Bayan, the Gajin, Masaja, Gilos, and the Kuro Tower. ก็อยู่นานอย่างนั้นอย่างก็อยู่เช็คช่วงเดียวเลยแต่ทำเช็คเลยเช็คยังเช็คได้มั้งเดี๋ยวเดี๋ยวเดี๋ยวเดี๋
Buddhism um, became uh, almost universally widespread uh, throughout Tibet, which really began uh, in the 8th century of the Common Era through the um, actions and influence of a uh, Tibetan uh, king and uh, two uh, Indian uh, masters whom he invited. That can look true, so not look also Gomio. No, not that. Over time, as tends to happen with religions, um, the tradition divided into sects or schools. There, generally, people say there are four of them, um, but each of them have subdivisions. So, for example, the, the Kaju school um, has um, four initial and eight subsequent uh, divisions, making uh, 12 types uh, of Kaju. I mention this because it's important to understand um, when you approach the, the details of Tibetan Buddhist study and practice that each of these traditions and each of the sub-traditions within the traditions are slightly different. It would do none of them any justice to claim that there are no differences. But, for example, if we consider the, the uh, 12 uh, branches of the Kaju tradition, such as the Karma Kaju, Trikun Kaju, and so forth. All of them practice Mahamudra, the Great Seal. And um, there are uh, differences, uh, real differences, in how Mahamudra is presented in each of these traditions, but no difference in what it, they are presented. Similarly, um, the oldest Tibetan Buddhist school, which is simply called the oldest, or Nyingma, um, all Nyingma traditions, of which there are countless ones, uh, practice uh, some form of Dzogchen, for the great perfection. And um, as the centuries have gone on, <coughs> the number of different Dzogchen traditions within the Nyingma tradition uh, has uh, increased. As with each century, there have been visionary uh, treasure revealers who have uh, placed their own stamp on these teachings. Now, all of the teachings that they present come originally from Guru Rinpoche, Guru Padmasambhava. But the, one of the values of the, the treasure or term of tradition is that each presentation of it uh, is appropriate to the time and place. So we have these two traditions, Mahamudra and Dzogchen, and uh, each of them uh, can be presented quite differently. And that brings us to the question that many people uh, like to ask, which is, uh, is there any di inherent difference between Mahamudra per se and Dzogchen per se? Are Mahamudra and Dzogchen the same uh, or different? Um, a previous interpreter of mine who is now deceased, was interpreting for a great uh, Nyingma Kempo and, uh, in New York City. And uh, a person attending this Kempo's teaching, Kempo Petsu uh, was the Kempo, um, posed the question, are Mahamudra and Dzogchen the same or different? So the interpreter, whose name was Chuchong Radha, and uh, many of you I would remember him. The interpreter translated this question to Kempo Petse. Now, Kempo Petse meant to say they're the same. In fact, he did say that, but he said it in his dialect, and he's from a 
from a place that's now in the province of Sichuan, called Golok. Uh, and in Golok, they pronounce words that you'd normally say e, like as though it were an i in English, a short i, as a, as though it were a, an American a. So he pronounced chikpa the same as chakpa, which in Tibetan means shit. <laughs> so the answer that he gave, the translator of course understood, but the, the, the answer that he gave was to the question, are Ma Mudra and Dzogchen the same or different, was Ma Mudra and Dzogchen are shit. <laughs> To give you a, a, a perhaps more informative <coughs> and certainly more respectful answer to that question, <laughs> historically, down to the present day, uh, those who in their practice and study and training emphasize one or the other of these traditions will often claim that the one that they know best is supreme. So. Mahamudra people will often say Mahamudra is the best because of this, this, and this. And Dzogchen people will similarly also say Dzogchen is the best because of this, this, and that. What we can say to join these viewpoints is simply that um, while what they do to the practitioner or for the practitioner is the same, definitely the methods employed uh, are significantly different. Uh,大家听听就告诉了。嗯,他听听讲呢,讲呢,讲呢。他准备一件多了,讲呢,就了,讲呢。讲呢,那我们就干不到我听呢,所以我们讲呢,讲呢,讲呢,讲呢,讲
to backtrack for a moment, whether you practice the uh, Mahamudra, the Mahamudra tradition, or the Dzogchen, the Dzogchen tradition, the point is the same. The point and purpose of either tradition, of either uh, practice, is uh, to tame our minds. And when our minds are fully tamed, what we discover, what we become, uh, is Buddha. And that is the fruition, the result. So fruition Mahamudra is Buddha. Fruition Dzogchen uh, is uh, Buddha. They can't be two different fruitions because the discovery, the process, consists of the discovery of your mind's innate, already present qualities. It consists of revealing uh, what is already there. To expand on this a little bit, a mind, any mind, is what in the Buddhist tradition called Sugata Garbha or Buddha nature. But the mind per se, the mind itself, is wrapped up in, covered by what we call kleshas, mental afflictions, such as those five poisons that I mentioned earlier. The process of the path, therefore, consists of removing these veils, these coverings. And when they are removed, what is discovered, all that is left, what is revealed, is what the Mahamudra tradition would call Great Vajradhara, what the Dzogchen tradition would call Samantabhadra, father and mother. But nevertheless, regardless of which tradition we practice, in order that it work, in order to actually practice either one of these systems and to do so effectively so that we actually succeed in removing our veils or coverings, we must start with the awakened mind. We must start with bodhicitta. In the process of the path, we have to continuously and repeatedly give rise to and constantly strengthen and reinforce our bodhicitta and go through the process of the path, the accumulation of that which is positive and the gradual discarding of that which is negative. The result uh, of either one of these parallel traditions, parallel processes, is going to be, as I said, the same. It's going to be equal. There are not two different types uh, of, of Buddha. In any case, um, we'll be uh, discussing the details uh, of these things tomorrow and Sunday uh, when I present um, a few uh, of the songs uh, of attention on the Dorje. So, having begun by saying I'm not going to talk about Mahamudra and Dzogchen, <laughs> that was to talk about Mahamudra and Dzogchen. Um, but now I would like to ask your questions. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, Ramachet. Um, I'm curious, uh, in discussing that the methods are different, um, is it accurate to say, well, in, in many sanghas that present or you utilize the methods of both traditions, it seems that uh, Mahamudra usually comes first. As an example, um, in a Dzogchen Pana Brimbache Sangha, Usually his students will train in Mahamudra, and then when they complete a certain amount of that training, they progress into Dzogchen. It was similar in Chogyam Trungpa's uh, Sangha. I'm wondering if that's an accurate characterization to distinguish between the two, like um, to say that uh, 
that it's usually characterized that Mahamudra seems to be more of a progressive approach, whereas Dzogchen focuses more on some kind of in instantaneous approach that requires more maturity. Is that an accurate way to, to look at it? Tumorama <laughs> Zochen, Chimbuvi, it's an interesting question. Um, it seems that uh, basically what, what's happening, um, first of all, the masters who teach both Mahamudra and Dzogchen are Kajubas, fundamentally. And so they are, such as the two you mentioned, they're more fundamentally uh, kaju. Mm -hmm. And uh, all kaju lamas will present at some point the Mahamudra preliminaries and the Mahamudra meditation practices. And the reason they do so is those students who are naturally drawn to them or attracted to them obviously have some kind of karmic connection with, uh, with their kaju tradition, which means that it's quite likely that they are going to be uh, benefited more by the kaju approach of Mahamudra and so on. If someone um, studies from the beginning with a nyingma master, in other words, entirely nyingma, there won't be any Mahamudra at any point. It will simply be the Dzogchen preliminaries and the Dzogchen principle of practices. Neither approach is in any way incorrect because they're designed for those students who are naturally karmically uh, disposed to study the one or the other tradition with the one or the other type of master. Kaiju students uh, do uh, best if they practice Mahamudra, and then they may or may not go on to also practice Dzogchen. And Yingma students do best if they practice the Dzogchen tradition uh, from the beginning. It's not that either one is better for beginners or better for advanced people, it's simply the, the karmic openness uh, that the particular student will have.
the Cinder. Oh. I think you just answered one of my questions. Well, then why are you asking it? Sorry. Well, <laughs> <laughs> give me time. Um, my first question is about Bodhicitta. I work with trying to manifest it, but sometimes I meet people that push my buttons. And um, lately, instead of getting angry at them, what I find is I just shut down. It's like a wall drops. Um, and I, I just in terms of the bodhisattva vow, we're supposed to always be open and, and try to help, but I wondered if you had any advice on how to handle that. And then I do have a second part. That <laughs> ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、
is actually how we increase uh, our bodhicitta. And it also uh, prevents um, our imperfections from becoming in, in any way a contradiction uh, of the bodhicitta vow. And as I mentioned, this uh, is a, 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 a very important thing about the bodhisattva vow that you, know, you brought up with your particular situation. Thank you. Can I ask the second part? No. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> I feel silly asking this because Zogchen and Mahamudra are so far beyond me. But um, my first contact with a Buddhist teacher was with Kempo Kartar at, at KTD, um, my refuge lama. So I'm firmly connected with the Kaju. I've always been magnetized by what I've read about Zogchen, it just intrigues me very much. And I'm heartbroken I can't go up to KPL for those teachings. So in that case, when a person is kind of mixed up, does it mean that I should just stick with Mahamudra and not worry about Zogchen? Or what does that mean? ขอได้เชื่อสิ่งที่ Zokin then well, this again brings up a, a, a very general, a general issue, which in a certain sense we already touched on with the previous question. There is a there is a traditional answer uh, to this that one should um, study uh, both impartially and widely and uh, practice uh, with uh, one pointed focus. If a, if a student is limited by circumstances uh, or the, the guidance of one of their teachers to only, to only study one of these two traditions, so if somebody only learns Mahamudra from start to finish, ground, path, and fruition Mahamudra, never hears a word of Dzogchen, never has the opportunity to study it, or similarly only learns Dzogchen, learns nothing of Mahamudra, this may um, impede their spiritual progress because they may have uh, karmic, some karmic residue with the other tradition. As beginners, we don't really know for sure what is going to spark some kind of uh, realization, some kind of growing experience or growth in us. So it's better in the context of receiving teachings and um, study and understanding to um, do so as widely and impartially uh, as possible. By doing so, eventually you will come to an experience of what really helps you, what really works for you. And it's quite possibly something you couldn't have predicted uh, from the beginning. Then once you know what that is, once you're certain, then you can focus one point of on that. <laughs> Pena 
based on what I've seen again and again over the many years that I've lived and taught in this country is that uh, when teachers tell their students not to study with anyone else, not to study or practice anything that isn't taught by them, and this does occasionally happen, when teachers tell their students to do that, they're probably doing it because they think that those whose karmic connection is primarily with them only need them. The problem is that the audience of that teacher is invariably going to include students whose primary karmic connection is not with them. What will happen is if that person obeys that teacher's instruction not to study with anyone else, nothing will happen, nothing good. They'll, uh, they won't gain, they won't progress, they won't uh, gain any uh, experience, let alone realization, and they'll end up giving up Dharma entirely. And uh, Rinpoche said, I've seen this many, many times. It doesn't matter what tradition the teacher is requiring their students to, to stick to, whether it's a, a Mahamudra tradition or a Dzogchen tradition, it doesn't matter. There are going to be people whose primary karma connection is something other than what they're teaching, and they should be free to explore this and discover this uh, for themselves. So speaking for myself, I never tell people that. I never say that. I never say to people, you know, my stuff, the stuff I'm teaching you is the best there is. You don't need anything else. Don't practice anything else. Don't study anything else. Don't go to anyone else. I never, ever do and never, ever will say that. <laughs> The reason is, you know, if, if it were the Buddha teaching, the Buddha can see people's karma like as though it's in the palm of his hand. So he could say to you, well, your karmic proclivities are for this, so I think you should practice this and study this and read this and so on, and that will work best for you. Of course, the Buddha can say that, but I'm not the Buddha. I don't see things that clearly. Therefore, it would be criminally irresponsible of me to say such a thing, and I will never do it. Yeah, Michael? Yeah. Oh, oh, okay. Who's next to the uh, mic? I, you mentioned something about um, combining mindfulness and bodhicitta. Yes. How would I do that? 
Basically, the the um, the aspect of mindfulness uh, as applied to bodhicitta is fundamentally recollection of of the benefits of the bodhicitta, and the aspect of alertness or vigilance, uh, which kind of protects that mindfulness, is to be aware as much as possible and in every situation of what you're doing, saying, and thinking. Whether what you are about to do or in the process of doing is going to help uh, or harm. Same thing with speech and what you're thinking, what your motivation really is. So that you actually um, somewhat slow down your involvement in situations so that you can ascertain whether they're uh, worthwhile or not. Engaging. Oh, somebody else had one. Who had one? I have a quick one. Historically, is it fair to say that Guru Rinpoche and Yeshe Sojo were Zogchen practitioners and Machi Latdron was Mahamudra? Um, it's not quite that simple. Um, because it, in, if you're talking especially about Guru Rinpoche in India, these things weren't, the traditions weren't divided in the same way. It's, it's a little more complicated than that. Okay. Yeah. You know, and even in Tibet, uh, it would be very, very rare, almost impossible to find uh, a Mahamudra practitioner, thoroughly trained Mahamudra teacher, who had not also been trained uh, in, in Dzogchen. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, Yeah, um, acknowledging this isn't necessarily a quick or easy question to just throw out on a Friday evening. Um, can you help us understand how kind of the relative conceptual practices that are involved in generating and cultivating bodhicitta, the paramitas, things like that, can actually help us lead to the conditions that bring about a non-conceptual result? Like how? Do, how? Yeah. <laughs> That some Jimmy Tapi Nelo, Monson Tonga, the Langoma Cups of Sombate, Tokje Mayampa, Nampume Toka Yishiki, two years. Then, not to lay down Popa Cups of the Tokje Nyan Lendang, 
Um, it's a good question um, because it's a gradual transformation. Um, it's not the case, Rimshay said, that there's like up to a certain point your practice is conceptual and then all of a sudden, you know, you wake up one morning and your practice is now completely non conceptual. It's more a gradual process as, as, the, as the conceptual aspect um, becomes more and more refined. Then eventually the non-conceptual aspect becomes more and more present. But there's no boundary or border where it, where it changes. But to give you um, a simple you know, answer as though there were a boundary or border, Rupesha said it's basically that to the degree to which uh, your mind's nature is uh, revealed uh, to you in experience, your practice will be non-conceptual. Say that again, please. To the degree to which your mind's nature is revealed to you in direct experience, uh, your practice will be non-conceptual. Specifically about the environmental destruction or everything? Everything. Everything. Political too. Everything. That thing song, the Zambolin, the Nyankatabu, the Sitan, the Lopodro, the not so good. How we deal with it or how we fix it? Both. not so good. I'm waiting for someone to tell me. Nyambege, Jawa, Kari, and a drop that came to the door. Ning, 
general, you know, so always, um, the, the world that we live in, what we experience, uh, is samsara. We live in samsara. Which means that um, we have kleshas. We have mental afflictions. And if I may say so, nowadays it's uh, becoming fairly evident that our mental afflictions are on the increase. To respond to the understanding that the world is samsara, that our world, what we experience is samsara, by hating the world, hating what's happening in the world, and by forgetting that our experience of it is really through the filter of our own clashes, is an inappropriate response even to the worst of times. Because the most powerful thing that we can do for the world is for each of us, anyone who is willing to do so, to take responsibility for our own minds and our own states of mind. We may think that as good Buddhists, <laughs> we should reject the world, and hate the world, and say, the world is samsara. Samsara is out there. This is a samsaric world. It's impure. It's nasty. I don't like it. We may think that that's what Buddhism teaches, but it isn't. If we say this world is samsara and samsara is evil and bad, we are cultivating the klesha of anger. That is not the determination to be free which the Buddha taught. It's just another way of giving in to klesha. Samsara is not the particular world or historical period in which we live. It is our not knowing how to act. Our not knowing how to treat others, not knowing how to treat ourselves, not knowing how to treat the physical environment of this world. And that's not on the world, that's on us. So. What is the correct or appropriate or helpful response to this, that nowadays our glaciers are increasing and things are looking pretty grim? Not to hate the world or demonize the world or anyone in it, but uh, to make the aspiration 
may we all learn what to do and what not to do. May we all learn how to treat ourselves, others, and the environment. And we are only protected from samsara if we adopt that attitude without partiality, without trying to blame anything or anyone in the external world. The story is very, very commonly found all over the world. Uh, in the Buddhist tradition, it's, it's in the uh, Bodhicaravatara by Shantideva that you cannot cover the entire world with leather to prevent your feet being um, pierced by thorns. But you can cover the soles of your feet with leather. And now I, sh I should probably say rubber, or whatever it is we make. And this is why there's really nothing better than bodhicitta. Just as if you, if you have shoes on, wherever you go, they're protecting your feet without your having to interfere with the external world. If you have bodhicitta, by which I mean that you're truly impartial, that your benevolence, wanting everyone to be happy and not to suffer, is truly universal, that nobody is written off, nobody is excluded, then that's like wearing good shoes. See if I can do this. Um, if person A feels from what they've studied or read that they're drawn towards Dogten approach and person B feels the same uh, about what they feels drawn to Mahamudra, um, that uh, uh, as far as them uh, coming to terms with the ground of their practice to where they're actually entering the path, is there any difference uh, uh, for those people? Or are they kind of up against the same? Do you mean is their process going to be essentially the same? Uh, yeah, I, or uh, they're not going to encounter a separate set of problems, or? Okay. <laughs> Well, we need C and D, because uh, there's ba basically, <laughs> now, if a, if a person practicing the Mahamudra tradition has a primary karmic connection with the Mahamudra tradition, they will experience no obstacle and their progress will be uh, good. If a person practicing the Dzogchen tradition 
has a primary karmic connection with the Dzogchen tradition, then they will experience no obstacle uh, in their progress will be good. Is it, was that what you were asking about the about the? No, it's probably imagining too much into it, but that uh, or for as Rinpoche first said at the beginning that that. Uh, in a way, the high talk and the high pollutant subject matter is kind of hard for any of us to deal with. But what we want to, uh, them kind of getting down to the the, the basic muck and mire of where we all live, in a way, but uh, and trying to develop a practice. It depends on the person's faith and devotion. If they're practicing that in which they have faith and devotion, their progress will be a swift and without obstacle. If they're practicing that for which they have less or no faith and devotion, they're going to have problems. Is that C and D? Well, that's that's no, that's one and two because it's a, it's a different yeah. grid. Like okay. This. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. <laughs>